All right, guys, Adam Trigger here, wagertalk.com. It is the second of 30 college basketball previews we're going to run throughout the month of October. And I've got a special guest today. Uh, my friend Greg Coonley is with us. Um, you can't find him anywhere. He, he's not a uh, social media personality. He's just a Providence alum and a diehard Providence basketball fan. And he did such an excellent job on our preview last year that I had people saying, you know, where's the Providence guy? How, how do I get in touch with him? Where do I find his stuff? And I said, you can't. But, you know, I passed along a couple of uh, messages to him. He's locked into Providence Hoops, and he's going to help me figure out uh, what we're going to do with the Providence Friars this year. So welcome in, Greg. Thank you for taking the time, uh, you know, to, to chat with us about uh, Friar basketball. And the, the point of this preview is, is to kind of build toward, uh, uh, you know, what we're going to do with this team come November 4th when the season starts. And we're, you know, and we can bet on them. That That is the point. It is a betting preview. So uh, welcome in. How's it going? And just tell me your, your general excitement going into year two of the Kim English era in Providence. Yeah, thanks for having me on again, Trig. Uh, pleasure to be back. And uh, people really, really, really want to find me. Um, <laughs> you can uh, you, you can send them the direct Insta handle and and, and I'll help them out. But uh, we're excited. We're, we're as a as a fan um, as a group of fans, Friar fans. We're we're pumped. Uh, year one of King, Kim English. You know, I, I think things could have went a little bit better. Uh, you have the Hopkins injury. We'll get into all that. But uh, I think what we see in a in a coach is a is a young leader, uh, a guy with a, a plan and a system. Uh, certainly an ability to recruit. And I don't think the fan base has lost any of its excitement from uh, two years ago with, with Ed Cooley and uh, three years ago with the Sweet 16 run. I think we're, you know, as, as enthusiastic as ever. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll just chime in on as regards to Kim English. I love this guy. I mean, I got a chance to watch him closely and kind, kind of meet him in passing down in the Bahamas last year um, at, at the Bahamar Classic. And, you know, follow Providence throughout the season. He's someone I, I followed during his, his brief tenure at George Mason. Uh, I just think that he's, you know, from a like a, a motivational standpoint, just a phenomenal coach, like someone that I would want to play for. Uh, you know, I know he's been a little bit criticized for like X's and O's at time, at times during his time at George Mason. And, and you know, I don't know how many games he's going to win you like during the game. But as far as, you know, being a recruiter, a program builder, and an identifier of, like, good kids to bring into the program, I think he's a tremendous coach. And we saw last year that he can, you know, he, he faced some adversity and had some success. And, and specifically, I mean, the defense was really good last year for Providence. And, and who really knows what would have happened if, if Bryce Hopkins doesn't go down? So, you know, I, I really think English is – the right guy here. Obviously they kind of had to go get him. Um, you know, it was unexpected that Cooley was going to leave. Uh, but I think they found a winner and, and I think he probably has this team take a step forward this year. Yeah, I would agree. And I would say, uh, you're spot on with the ability to recruit and to build a program. I think anytime your head coach can get on the floor and, and outplay uh, a kid in one-on-one <laughs> outplay them in, in a scrimmage, um, show them the ropes of what it's like to be a former NBA player and, former college star, uh, that goes a long way in recruiting. You got to stay young. You got to stay, I don't know what the word for hip is anymore, but whatever that is, uh, you, you got to be able to relate to your players. And I think what he's, he's, he's done is something very smart, which is bring in Dennis Felton as an assistant coach. And I think that's where, you know, the X's and O's and maybe what he lacks in experience from a uh, in-game standpoint, uh, he, he can compensate for having that that veteran voice on the bench with him to help him through some of those situations. And so, you know, again, I totally agree with the direction of the program. Um, NIL you know, seems strong as far as the donor involvement and kids wanting to come play, um, you know, and, and hopefully year two results in a, uh, in a run in March. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't understand why anyone wouldn't want to come play there. If you've ever been to a Providence game, it's always going to be the dunk to me, Greg. But at Amica Mutual Pavilion, phenomenal atmosphere, especially when the Big East teams get in there. And one thing I will you know, say before we move into the actual roster construction, while we're still talking about Kim English, there was a scenario down in the Bahamas uh, where Garway Dwall, no longer with the team, punched a player on Kansas State. It was like a little scuffle toward the end of that Providence-K State game. And 
I was in the locker room after the game because we were, I was with Kelly and, and we were going to get to meet Tang and say hi to Jerome Tang. And, and, you know, Kim came right in, kind of just came right into the visitor locker room. Like you rarely don't see that very often. Um, just walked right in. And this is a guy, it's not like he's, you know, what is he a third year coach, like in his career, third or fourth season um, and came right in, squashed it with Tang super mature. And it's just like, you know, I've seen young coaches before the, far less mature than, than what he showed there. And I just, again, he demands effort. The players seem to give it to him. And I go back to last year, you know, they finished top 20 in, in adjusted defensive efficiency in spite of some really crushing injuries. Hopkins going down, uh, you know, had to deal with other injuries at times and didn't really have like a, a, a actual big yet still played fantastic defense, defended the paint, defended the three point arc. Um, and, and, you know, so you, you one would have to think that if they can keep those sort of, you know, that philosophy and that intensity that they were able to play with last year, that, that it can only get better, at least from a defensive standpoint, because now you got a couple of bigs, um, you know, in the paint. So let's talk. Let's start there. Let's talk about the uh, front court specifically, uh, specifically Christ. I'm, I'm going to butcher these names. I, I don't know if you've got the pronuncia- pronunciation down, but I know it's Essendoko. I will Essendoko. murder the other name. So, But we've got a couple of seven-footers now that they didn't have last year. Talk to me about these bigs and, and how they can make an impact on the defensive end. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about Essendoko. And, and for Oswin, we're just going to call him Oswin. We're not going to make any attempt <laughs> at his last name, uh, though I do think eventually he will be uh, a guy that, that most people in the Big East will, will know and, and, and maybe – uh, nationwide as well. Uh, but you mentioned it, you know, two seven footers, right? Last year, you have Josh Odoro, really big, strong guy, positional player who can use his body to get to rebounds and, and to post up and to be effective on offense. And now you've got two guys who are kind of the opposite mold of, of what you look for in a big that are playing above the rim. Uh, Odoro is, you know, a guy who's going to use spin moves and fakes and, and use his body to clear out. Uh, these two are uh, above the rim. They're above the square. They're above the entire backboard uh, in some of their highlight uh, highlight tapes. And so I think what that's going to allow for, it, block shots are a great stat. I, you know, there's no way to quantify um, shots altered or, or guys coming into the paint and uh, not finishing at a, at a clip they normally would because of the presence of, of big dudes like that. And so I think that's going to allow for the, the Providence defense to be very aggressive on the perimeter. Uh, go for steals, you know, f- ball ball pressure, um, be able to get in passing lanes. And if they get beat and if they get, you know, driven by, uh, you'll have those guys in the back to clean up the mess. So, you know, whereas, whereas Devin Carter was uh, an all, all-American type level defender, uh, I think you're going to see a lot of guys take a step forward in their individual defense. And as a team, uh, knowing that, you know, instead of having – um, a guy who's closer to the ground in, in back of them, they're going to have some guys who can slot into the third row. Yeah, I mean, I'm super excited about Essendoko because he's a guy, you know, I watched a lot of at St. Joe's. I felt like there was times where he looked a- as good as anyone in the league at that position, and then other times where he looked out of place. Like, that just comes with, I guess, you know, kind of being a, a somewhat inexperienced seven-footer uh, in college mm-hmm. basketball. But the, the thing I go back to with Kim English is – the effort he kind of demands out of his players. You even said it. He's probably the best player on the floor in practice. How many programs can say that? You know, I, I know for a fact that he still gets out there and, and plays with those guys, and I, I think it, it rubs off, you know, in a positive way. Um, so that'll be interesting to see if he can take the step forward with his conditioning because that was like the thing was staying on the floor and, and playing like starters minutes. Obviously, Providence would love him to come in and, and play – starters minutes I, I don't know if he can do that yet we'll see uh but it's nice you know that they have a, another big to sort of pair with them because that was something they really didn't have last year and then completely didn't have last year when Hopkins went down so you know that's kind of like you know as we go to the offensive side of the ball I, I think that's probably the biggest question uh with what this Providence team is going to be is how healthy is Bryce Hopkins because, of course, he, he comes off an ACL injury. And, Greg, I'll let you elaborate. I don't know how far he is along, but I, I would imagine he probably isn't 100% just based on when he got hurt to start the season. But he is kind of like, if you look in the context of the Big East, I mean, he is the the probably one of the only players on this roster that would be considered a top player in the conference. 
So where do you think Hopkins is and, and how sort of impactful do you think that's going to be, you know, in terms of like Providence out of the gate this season? Yeah, the, the sense that I get and, and Providence and, and the team is keeping it pretty tight lipped as far as his his rehab and progress. But the sense we get is, you know, the, the uh, non-conference season will be sort of eased in and probably, uh, you know, playing 15, 20, 25 minutes and working his way up to the uh, to the biggie schedule where hopefully he's he's good to go. Um, you know, his normal 32, 35 minutes, I think his, you know, his, his game has a bit of a ceiling, right. In, in terms of, uh, again, not necessarily a high flyer. He's a, he's a slasher. He's a guy who's trying to develop his outside shot really struggled with that before he got hurt last year. Um, so as, as great of a player as he is, you know, I don't think Providence is leaning on him to have to be a, a 18 or 20 point per game score. I think he's going to be, you know, probably somewhere closer to the 14, 15 number, um, but be the guy that they go to down the stretch to get a bucket with his veteran leadership um, when they're in a, a, a close and tight game, you know, on the road in the big East. So uh, no definitive news on, on where he's at with that rehab, but you know, there hasn't been any mentions of setbacks. And I think given that opening night would be about the 10 month mark, um, you're probably looking at a kind of a gradual, uh, return to normal game action over the course of some of the cupcakes they have early. Yeah, that that schedule's pretty favorable early, and that's something I'll I'll save for the end when we talk about like our betting outlook and how to approach this team. But we'll talk about that early season schedule. But while we're on the offense, I, I'd imagine the key to Providence taking a real step forward and, and going from like fringe bubble team to like legitimate top twenty-five team NCAA tournament team uh, is going to be Jaden Pierre. You know, he was at times looked awesome last season at times was inconsistent would turn the ball over, but it feels to me like he's got more help this year. I guess, I guess we don't know who steps up, but Kim English went out and got some guards and obviously Pierre is still there. So you lose Carter, but there is, you know, I guess reason to be optimistic about this backcourt. So let, let's talk about sort of the four or five guards back there. Who do you think is going to start and who do you think is going to be the guy that steps up? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think it's going to be more so by, by committee trig. I think you look at last year uh, and even previous years, you know, going back to the last 10 years, Providence has only been in the top 75 of Ken Palm's offensive metrics twice. Uh, so they're not typically a, an extremely efficient team on the offensive side of the ball. And that's with stars like Hopkins and Carter, you know, and before them, uh, Al Durham and, and going back to even Chris Dunn and, and Bryce Cotton. And so, uh, th this team, I think, has the potential to to uh, have four or five guys, as you said, who, who may shoot in, in between that 35 and 40 percent number from three. Uh, I look at Jaden Pierre and, you know, he was sort of forced into a point guard role. I think he's more of a combo guard. And, and it feels like uh, his high turnover rate in conjunction with Bensley Joseph coming in and, and sort of his turnover woes. Is that you know this team's going to look to to move the ball around um, and fit Kim English's style, which is ball movement, um, getting wings open, uh, drive, penetrate, and kick, and not necessarily rely on point guard sets where you're looking at high screen and rolls and and really keeping the ball in in a playmaker's hand. So I expect Pierre to have uh, a much lower turnover percentage. I think Bensley Joseph will go a long way with his leadership coming in from Miami to help in that regard. And then you're going to stack the floor with at least three or four different shooters, as I said, that, that can uh, really light it up. You, Rich Barron coming back from um, a freshman year where he shot 43%. Uh, Jabri uh, Abdul-Rahim coming in from, from Georgia where you know he's, he was a 37% guy on pretty high volume last year. Um, you've got a kid in Justin Fernandez that... <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, is coming over after redshirting a year from George Mason that, that can really fill it up from deep. So I, I think, that, you know, this team, and we'll, we'll talk about the, the wagering angle, but rather than being a, a grinded out defensive team that needs to win games in the high 60s um, and plays a ton of close and, 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 and tight games in, in conference, I think you're going to see a lot more variance with the Friars this year where they will have nights where they shoot 14 of, of 24 from three or, or 15 of 31 from three and, and blow teams out of the water. And then also have nights where they, you know, rely on the three and are a little bit off. So, um, you know, I, I expect, uh, I expect different guys to step up at different times. I think you'll see a, a very 
balance uh, score sheet in, in a lot of cases where you may have five or six guys scoring between eight and, and 13 points. Um, but the backcourt is definitely deeper than it was last year. You're not solely relying on a Devin Carter. Uh, Pierre doesn't have to shoulder as, as much of the load. And, and I think that's going to be a benefit to him. Yeah, and that's a great, uh, you know, a great point that we're going to circle back on at the end as well. But one other guy I wanted to bring up as a as someone that watches a ton of mid major basketball that bets on a mid majors a lot, um, I always like when I see one of these like sort of low major mid major players end up on a, on a team like this. And so I'm super excited about Wesley Cardat Jr., uh, Chicago State transfer. If you haven't watched Chicago State basketball before. It, it really is a, an experience, not necessarily a good one. It, it's like a, a total just, I mean, there's probably two dudes on the floor that can actually play. Cardet was one of them. At times, I felt like he was like two on five last year. Um, you know, one of the, the lowest programs in Division One in terms of like, you know, they just finally found themselves a conference, or I guess they're in a conference again in the, North, in the NEC. So they're going to be playing teams like LeMoyne, Central Connecticut State. I mean, it's the bottom of Division One, uh, but Cardet could ball. I mean, this was he was fun to watch. You know, at, even in like a total helter skelter environment, would put up 20, 25 points. I'm really interested to see him in this environment with a real coach like Kim English, who is probably going to put some clamps on him from a uh, shot volume standpoint because he's got team teammates. So, you know, his numbers are pretty good. It, you wonder if. He's going to be forced to take better shots, probably take less shots. You wonder. I, I it's it's a total wild card, but I'll be interested to see if his efficiency numbers go up because he should be, you know, taking better shots this year. At least you would think. Uh, and if he can score like he did at the low major level, could be a total wild card for this Providence team. Yeah, and, and Trey, you know, we've had examples just in the Big East of Tristan Newton and Tyler Kolig coming from smaller low major programs, mid major programs and, and making that jump and being all league guys. Um, I have no reason to believe that that Cardat won't do the same. And I, and I leave him off that, that initial list of wing players and shooters that I mentioned before, because he is the one guy that I think is, is more dynamic. Um, and, and the guy that I do expect uh, to lead the Friars and ultimately in scoring um, his ability to get to the hole, to get to the line. Like you said, he's playing two on five, uh, for three years in his career and now can go to a, a program where he's not going to draw as much attention and he's got some help around him. So, you know, I, I, I don't know that he, again, is a 18, 20 point per game guy. I don't know that he has to be. Um, but depending on what happens with Hopkins, I think he's absolutely option number one or, or 1A to be the guy touching the ball at the end of the game uh, to draw a key foul, to get to the free throw line, to score at, at multiple levels. Um and we're, we're excited. I, I, I don't see a, a reason why, you know, a guy like that can't succeed in a, in a system with better players, um, especially knowing that it's his final year and he's playing for something meaningful for the first time in his career. Yeah. I, like I said, I, I think I told you offline uh, before we started this. I, I, I think he's the wild card if, if he pans out. And, you know, there's examples of, of a guy like him not working, maybe just as many as there are where they do work. But I mean, if they can sort of like harness his ability and, and and turn him into a guy that can score 15 a game in the Big East could be very dangerous, you know, in the context of this team. So that brings us to the betting perspective here. And this is a betting show. We are, a, a, you know, this is a betting preview. So we want you to leave with, with an idea of like something actionable for this team. And, and so my two questions really are, are this one, how quickly is Hopkins Hopkins, how quickly is he a hundred percent? And, you know, it sounds like you have kind of looked at the schedule the way I have and said, all right, they, maybe, maybe they don't, we, I don't know how much we even see him for those first couple weeks, or at least it'll probably be pretty limited. And then at least in the early going, I feel like Pierre is going to kind of be the, the go-to guy just based on the fact that he's the returning, you know, sort of incumbent, if you will, in the backcourt and how comfortable is, is he in that role? But you look at the schedule, which you alluded to, this is how they open all home games, Central Connecticut State, Stonehill, Hampton, Green Bay, Delaware State. I mean, not not good basketball teams. That being said, I got I will be looking for a spot in, in those first five games, probably to take a big number. I don't know who I trust enough. Like, you know, out of those teams, like Providence might be able to smash any of those teams 
you know, regardless. But I have a feeling maybe maybe it's Hampton, maybe it gets Green Bay. Like somewhere in there, Providence, they're going to be a major favorite in those first five games. I don't think they're going to cover all five. I actually probably would be surprised if they cover more than like three of those based on what I think the numbers are going to be. But then, Greg, you guys go down to the Bahamas for battle for Atlantis, playing Oklahoma, potentially Arizona, a big home game against BYU, a big rivalry game at Rhode Island, and then a, a neutral site game against St. Bonaventure, and then right in a big, big East play. So the way I'm kind of looking at this team, and I'll give you a chance to rebuttal, is I'll probably look to, to play against them at some point early. But if everything pans out the way I think it's going to, they're probably going to be a, a, a sneaky bet in Big East play and a good team to play on. So long term, I'm thumbs up on Providence. If they stay healthy, I think Kim English will have them playing really good basketball when it matters going into January and February. But I will probably look to fade them in the early going. How are you kind of seeing it playing out for for this team? Yeah, the one rebuttal I would have to those early five games, and, and Providence historically has been awful at covering big numbers. And, and one of the reasons is because they don't have the depth traditionally um, to be able to get up by a 20-point lead and then bring in the bench and sustain that. And so I think because they have so many of these maybe B, B-plus players that, that go 10 and 11 deep, you're bringing in bench guys that really aren't that much of a drop-off from, from where your starters are. That couple of the ability to shoot the three, I think, will will allow them to cover uh, some of those games. I agree. I, I wouldn't you know, feel great about laying a, a 25 or 22 point number with the Friars until I see a little bit more. Um, but I do think, you know, in comparison to, to previous years, they are more, more equipped to do that. I think the angle for me will be at that Atlantis tournament. And I hate to be pessimistic because I'm, I'm Friars through and through, Trey, you know that. But uh, if, if Hopkins isn't back to a level where he's comfortably playing 30 minutes per game and 80 to 90 percent of, of what he was before, Playing great teams like you mentioned, who are going to be also at Atlantis early in the schedule, is going to be difficult uh, for the Friars, I think, to execute down the stretch and, and beat good teams. They're still going to have to find out whether or not Cardet can be that guy if, if Hopkins can't be. Um, if, if he's not, you know, do you go to a Pierre who's who's a little bit undersized? Do you count on uh, one of the bigs, you know, to have a mismatch or, or one of your outside shooters to, to light it up and carry you to a victory? And so. I'm a little bit pessimistic about that stretch of the schedule, but I will say that that once Big East season, um, you know, we, we turn the corner into into that part of the schedule, I think you're going to get some favorable numbers with some teams in the Big East that, in my opinion, are maybe a little bit overrated. Um, and then an angle that I really like to the beginning of the year is you mentioned how, how great Providence was defensively, and we talked about the shot blocking. The reality is, is you lose Devin Carter, who's a, a shutdown guy who can, who can guard anybody from a one to four. Um, and so you're relying on, on more of a team defense concept. And you're also relying on, though they are shot blockers, a true freshman and a red, red shirt sophomore who doesn't play a ton of minutes to, to man the pain and stay out of foul trouble and to be able to you know, secure rebounds and, and do everything they need to do to be that efficient. So I think the over is actually going to be a, a great play for, for the Friars early on. Um, I think their tempo is going to be a little bit quicker than last year, uh, having more options of ball movement. I think their defense, at least early, takes a bit of a regression. And so if you see some numbers in the 132 to 138 range, especially early, um, and I think this Friar team is very capable of putting up 85, 90, and, and, and maybe again taking a step back on defense and allowing uh, some teams to score more than you'd expect. Now that's a great point, and you know, as, as all the good things we've said about Kim English are, are things I, I truly believe. But I'd be remiss if I didn't point out he he has he doesn't have a great record in close games. Even if you go back to his George Mason days, he is he he has not been great in those like one possession games. And, you know, it, I'll, I'll give him I'm willing to give him a pass on the post Hopkins portion of the season last year, because I think that's just a, a crushing loss that's very difficult to overcome. But it's worth pointing out that he didn't have a great track record in close games at George Mason. And, you know, there, there's there's been nothing since to really refute that. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of with you, though. Great point on the over. Didn't really think of that. I definitely think based on last year's numbers, you are, are bound to get some very playable uh, totals early in the season with Providence because all the metrics show them as a, a, a top 20, you know, defensive team from last year. Um, so that wraps up our preview. 
a big shout out to Greg for taking the time to join us and talk some Friars basketball. Um, like and subscribe to the channel and keep an, an eye out. We're going to have 30 of these uh, before it's all said and done going into tip off on November 4th. That was Providence Friars, and we'll see you guys again tomorrow for a different 30 for 30 preview right here on Wager Talk TV.